Um, yes, hello, my name is Cornelius Sharp from Finio, a nonprofit think tank and consultancy here. Um, I have a question about the types of innovation. I very much like this distinction between um, upfront innovation and incremental innovation. I would like to bring in maybe another type, <coughs> you want to call it a type of innovation, which is maybe you could call it uh, attention seeking innovation, um, uh, which I experience a lot working with companies, with foundations, um, with the nonprofit sector in Germany, which is not so much about improving let's say the social case and making things better in the world for the business, for the nonprofit and for society, but rather thinking about the battle for attention in the media, you know, for funding. And so I would like to ask you as a panel how you, how you place the discussion of in, uh, innovation into that battle of attention that we see every day. If you look at any competition, har almost every competition um <coughs> for new uh, projects, let's say in the social entrepreneurship world or Nonprofits. Um, one criterion for success is almost always it has to be innovative. If you ask them what that means, it's maybe different answers, but it at least it's always a question. And I think what comes back, <coughs> um, if you ask them why that is, it's because these people are being measured by producing something innovative. Um, and maybe that might be by the shareholders, by the media, by their bosses. So my question would be, how do you deal with that conflict and that dilemma? Thank you. Can we ask you directly, like, to? Up, 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 up. I think you have you have raised a, a very valid uh, third kind of innovation, attention-seeking innovation. But in my opinion, attention-seeking innovations, if if you if you if you if you just want to attract attention and have some initial funding, but that will not sustain over the long run. We have seen in Bangladesh multiple organizations who have started new ideas to create uh, an, an attention and, and seek some financing. It has, over the year, they have, they have just, just uh, uh, not sustained. Uh, but but the, exp the innovation which is, which is sustainable, uh, which has, which has long-term impact, can sustain in the long run. Like, like if you look at the, the, the type of work we are doing in the environmental sector, uh, we have sustained over 20 years huh? and we have grown from a small one experiment to a program where uh, uh, like, like what Alnur has mentioned, like upfront innovation, we started the project in 1994, a small neighborhood based project. Over the years, like in last year, in 2012, government of Bangladesh has established a national program where they will finance this kind of project uh, and they will give up money to municipalities to do this kind of project. So what, what my, my, my only comment is that attention seeking innovations will not sustain over time and, and, and this, uh, the, the innovations which are more sustainable, uh, have long term impact, will sustain and can have uh, a long term impact. Not only in the region, it can go beyond the region. The example of microcredit or or if you look at the example of Arvind, where it is going beyond, uh, beyond, beyond the region, is because of the, the long-term impact. And it was not meant for seek attention, but it was rather meant to solve a problem which is, which is genuine. And there, there is a gap where government or private sector is not interfering. So those are the kind, kind of innovation or intervention will sustain. Yes, I know. Um, yeah, if I can pick up on this. Uh, I think there's an important connection here to, to Imran's earlier point about flexible financing. Um, I think the attention-seeking innovation is a symptom of the funding environment. And so people want to fund things that are sexy, right? They want to fund things that make a splash that they can then take credit for having supported. It's far less attractive um, to fund the difficult slogging work of scaling something, right? In the end, you might be able to take some credit for scaling that impact, but it means you have to stay in that game for a decade or a generation. And so the, the problem that I see there is that we have within the social sector relatively poorly developed capital markets. And so we don't have a way of transitioning organizations that actually have an innovation to then taking them to scale. Um, and so one way of approaching this is through the kind of flexible financing model that BRAC has that Imran alluded to, 
Um, but let me just mention briefly um, a couple of other experiments, which are essentially innovations in financing. Um, so one is all of this attention right now around social impact bonds, um, pioneered in the UK, now spreading to other parts of the world, where the idea is, can you get the private sector um, to actually finance something that normally the public sector would do, um, that then the funds get distributed to the nonprofits or other implementing organizations, but the private sector takes the risk. And if, based on certain performance metrics, that succeeds, um, then the government or others would repay the, finance, uh, the, the financing of the private sector with some nominal interest rate. And so there's an innovation in financing here. The second example um, within the US uh, has been developed by a foundation, the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation, um, which used to fund hundreds of organizations, relatively small grants, $75,000, $100,000 a year, um, and decided to shift in its focal area, which is children and youth, to funding a much smaller number of organizations, but taking on the seeking of financing for those organizations itself. And so Edna McConnell Clark partnered with the Gates Foundation, with a whole bunch of other foundations, and raised something like $50 million, I think it's much more than that now, to, to give to three organizations. And so the challenge was for the foundation, it calls this a growth capital aggregation fund. Its challenge was to innovate with the financing, so that the organizations that already had innovated and had a proven model could take that then to scale. So I think what you're describing is a symptom of the funding environment. Thank you, we had a question on, yes, you have already the mic. Great. Thank you, my name is Angelica, thank you for this discussion. My question is um, bringing up one of the challenges that were brought up earlier that organizations are held accountable to predictable outcomes and that's particularly the case um, that we have the expectation um, and how we hold our governments accountable. Therefore, how can we create a framework or facilitate processes that allow radical innovation within our government institutions? Thank you. The government institution, that's probably not necessarily the expertise of our panelists here, but you might call it as the extreme case. So if you uh, think about radical innovation in the governance, uh, in, in the government, that probably is the most challenging thing. The question, uh, a question though that we would as, as researchers uh, probably pose is, why do you need radical innovation there in the first place? So first, uh, first I think it's always the, the question of why do you assume that radical innovation is good there? I mean, I'm with you when it comes down to uh, that we need more institutional innovation in a way, that we, we develop a capacity that the institutions that we create also can rejuvenate each other. The other thing is like whether there needs to be radical innovation all the time. I definitely open it up to our panelists, but I'm not sure whether that's really the, 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 the scope of the discussion today. I'd like to offer just a short comment on that. Um, uh, you know, I think that's the that's the useful way of framing the question. Um, so this is this is so my view is that um, that government has the possibility to actually scale innovations. I'm not sure that its comparative advantage is the upfront kind of innovation. Um, but it still begs the point as to then what is what is the mechanism that allows the the, the shift the connection between the upfront. Um, and, the, and the scaling, um, and it turns out that possibly it's organizations like Waste Concern that are enabling this kind of connection. You know, historically, um, to reference the US again, uh, the philanthropic foundations were doing some of this. So Ford Foundation and its work in education in the 60s uh, was really well known for identifying and supporting innovations and then lobbying, not exactly lobbying, but doing policy work related to the government to get it to take up those innovations. We see much less of that in the foundation world today. Thank you. Uh, short. Just very short. 
Um, I want to offer an alternative view. I, so maybe we should also consider that innovation is not just an instrumental thing to get different things, but innovation is a way to rejuvenate organizations. I think people inherently want to play around from time to time with novelty. They want to experiment and fail and stand up and try. So a little bit of innovation, introducing that in all kinds of organizations, I think is a very productive way of keeping organizations, including the public sector, young, attracting the right people as well. So I think it's also an outlet for internal purposes, keeping the organization young. So I think that should be done, yes. We have room for and time for one last question. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Pedro Bando from the Hertz School, second year of the MPP. Uh, I I'm, I'm have a question regarding the uh, mindset and the over expectations of uh, the public, the bankers, the uh, entrepreneurs, how to deal with, with, the, with the mindset. We are now sitting here very nicely in Berlin, uh, we're having a sandwich, but when we uh, see all these projects happen elsewhere with a completely different culture, completely different mindset. So people, when they go and they start working on these issues, they take <coughs> the side of a banker and they want to see, they have over, over expectation and then they want to see returns, they want to see uh, we spoke about uh, performance management, performance uh, indexes and all that. So I wonder how do you handle this, this, this mindset which is completely different worlds, how to handle this? Who wants to take a... a look? Imran, do you? Uh, well, I mean, I, well, I, can, uh, uh, I think the mindset change issue is, uh, is a very important challenge. I mean, it's really about how you create a culture of innovation within uh, Within organizations that are uh, that are large, uh, and uh, you know that uh, also, I mean, it's not it's not only the bankers and you know the sort of other other type of institution, but also social organizations. So I think to me the real critical challenge is how do you maintain the balance between being young and being large. Uh, you know, uh, be, 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 you know, I mean, how do you create the sort of nimbleness of being young and being being large and create that mindset? Uh, and I think. I think the sort of the you know uh, again I mean I, I would you know speak from my experience in Brack. Um, what was what was baked into the culture of Brack as an organization is a very strong culture of field orientation. So right from the top to bottom, what was celebrated was your ability as a CEO manager to be able to speak about the realities of the field. What is really happening to our programs on the ground? How are they being delivered? What are the challenges that are being faced there? And in, in a way of granularity that actually is, can be, you know, uh, you know almost served as kind of, uh, 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 kind of obsession. So, you know, we would have senior leadership discussions in Bragg about a particular school that a particular manager, a senior manager saw before and enrollment was not very high. We would actually have discussions on that and we would expect our direct education to be able to talk about what is happening there. So I think, how do you hard break that kind of a call? Every organization will deal with it differently, but I think, I think that's, that's what, what this, is, this is really about. Thank you, Imran. And, um, we posed a provocative question, is innovation the holy grail? Well, we haven't really got the answer, but what we have also surfaced in this uh, discussion today again is that there might be a danger that we overrate innovation and underappreciate actually the small, the hard improvement work that is needed for social sector organization actually to achieve uh, the desired outcomes. Uh, we also have discussed the, the importance of appreciating failed innovation, the, that we allow uh, failed innovation and factor that in as Alnor was, was uh, referring to also in our measures of success, measures of performance and ultimately also recognize how difficult it is uh, to innovate uh, in the social sector. There is simply no magic bullet point. Thank you so much for joining us. A big applause to our panel. Imran, thank you so much for joining us still on Skype. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.